I introduce Jenniki Vamaram Vamarajan. That's a tough one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here and giving me this opportunity. Today, I will talk to you about uh, one of our recent research projects at Shell that I've been very passionate about. Um, I'll talk to you, I'll tell you a story, in fact, about how we've been experimenting with Fourier neural operators within deep learning architectures to accelerate PD-based flow and transport simulations. Um, I would like to thank my collaborators um, and mentors, Omar Alpak, Jim Jennings, Pandu Devarkota, and uh, Detlef. Without their significant expertise, this work wouldn't have been possible. Before I begin, uh, here is a cautionary note, cautioning you not to make any investment decisions based on what I'm telling you today. Well, um, large-scale numerical simulations of um, PD-based flow and transport simulations, um, they require HPC, and significantly are essential because they help you in mo modeling complex phenomena. Specifically, um, they help you in understanding various processes within the subsurface, whether it's for integrated reservoir modeling for hydrocarbon production, uh, CO2 storage modeling and assessments, or optimizing uh, hydrogen and thermal energy storage, and even geothermal reservoir modeling. However, these simulations are computationally expensive because of uh, nonlinear governing PDs, multi-scale uh, heterogeneities, and inherent subsurface uncertainty due to the geology itself. Therefore, state-of-the-art subsurface flow simulators can take hours or days to model million to billion cell models on HPC clusters. And it is imperative to develop surrogate models that can improve the time to solution with less compute or with less computational resources. Um, here on the right, you're looking at a picture uh, of a simulation where it shows you how CO2 plume migration uh, is evolving over time. Now, for projects such as this to do uh, a subsurface uncertainty evaluation for over 50 to 100 years, that will take at least thousands of simulations. Um, therefore, if we can speed up these simulations by a factor of 10 to the power 3 or at least 10 to the power 4, we would be creating a huge impact in the way we do accelerated model-based planning and management, um, increased decision robustness through uh, model-based optimization, better handle subsurface uncertainty uh, with the help of dynamic performance screening tools, uh, rapid probabilistic model calibrations for inverse problems, and we can also transfer all the deep learning methods uh, and learnings that we have from this problem to related fluid flow problems like in seismic, geomechanics, CFT, or even pore scale studies. Today, this is happening. AI is now solving some of the uh, hardest challenges in scientific simulations, uh, we, whether it is numerical weather predictions um, or drug discovery, fluid flow, material property modeling. We are seeing a lot of advances. Now, some of these major advances in AI have happened because we have been able to embed structures into our models. Now, when we have better structures uh, that fit um, uh, the data better with lesser data, but it fits faster and better, we improve our generalization. Even for scientific simulations, now we are seeing these advances, whether it is physics-based architectures, physics-informed architectures, or even physics-inspired. These new techniques are helping you to embed structures into your model, which can help enhancing our learning or learning these uh, multiple kinds of complexities at once. Some of the um, architectures that have been, or neural network-based approaches that have been adopted for flow and transport PDs. Now, recently, the first kind of operators that we've seen are finite-dimensional operators. Uh, uh, the recently proposed CCSNet study uh, belongs to this. They use a deep CNN to approximate uh, a solution between finite dimensional Euclidean spaces. Um, now, they are not mesh independent, uh, and, they, and also um, generalization outside the training scope can be hard. We then have neural FEMs or physics informed neural networks, where uh, you parameterize the solution as a neural network itself. Um, and they are mesh accurate and uh, are also resolution invariant. However, you model one instance of a PT and not a family of PDs. Therefore, it always requires train, retraining whenever you have new PD coefficients or functional parameters. 
Recently, we are seeing another class of operators called the neural operators. Now, these neural operators um, are basically uh, kernel integral transformations. They help you to learn a family of PDs or approximate a continuous solution. Um, th these, are, these networks are parameterized, again, by kernel integral transformations, such as graph convolutions, low-rank kernel decompositions, or even the Fourier convolutions that I will talk to you about today. Um, and here, uh, there, there are also mesh, uh, uh, mesh, uh, in, mesh invariant or grid resolution independent. And therefore, you can train these architectures at once uh, using data generated from various P, uh, PD solvers with multiple coefficients. And the recent most successful paper was on the Fourier neural operators. Now, Fourier, using Fourier transforms in neural networks is not a new idea. It was always done before. And especially for PDs, uh, convolutions in the spatial domain correspond to multiplications in the frequency domain. And that property has always been very useful for solving PDs. So if you see uh, the previous works, you will first see that Fourier uh, networks were always implemented as shallow neural networks with sinusoidal act activation functions. They helped you to enhance your uh, global receptivity fields, and, they were, and therefore better help for classification, regression tasks, or even for solving differential equations. Recently, we are also seeing that they are being used for massive speed up in training times, whether uh, using Fourier transforms to do your convolutional operations, or for, doing, um, or by, for replacing attention layers within transformers. And lastly, uh, they can achieve non-local receptive fields in deep learning models. Now, convolutional neural networks are known to have local receptive fields. And because of which, to improve performance, we build deeper layers or deeper architectures and so on. If you can use Fourier transforms to uh, embed these uh, neural operators within your convolutions, you can achieve mixed receptive fields. And they have been used uh, in this format in the fast Fourier convolution paper. They've also been used within recurrent neural network architectures uh, to better learn long-range interdependencies when you're doing time series predictions. Now, all of these properties that I just described are very useful for PDEs. And we would want to see, we, were, we just started out to experiment and see, okay, will it work for flow and transport PDEs? But there are various challenges when you're adopting networks for uh, flow and transport simulations. They're highly nonlinear coupled PDs. You have multi-phase, multi-physics, and multi-scale simulations. You have high-dimensional input parameter spaces with variable controls. These can be a lot of scalar controls, too. You have inherent parameter uncertainties. There's a need for high resolution, at least 10 million to 1 billion cells to capture these multi-scale heterogeneities. And lastly, there are spatial temporal predictions. So you're not just looking at 2D or 3D convolutions, but we want higher dimensional convolutions to be able to predict multiple time steps for at longer time horizons. So we've taken some simple starting steps to apply deep learning for flow and transport simulations. But for real 3D cases, we will need significant HPC resources, not just for 3D training, but also for generating the data itself. And so uh, we introduced to you the FRESnet++ model. Now here we embed uh, Fourier neural operators in a deep learning, uh, in a deep residual learning framework for multi-phase and multi-component uh, flow simulations in heterogeneous media. It's an encoder-decoder architecture capable of producing mixed receptive fields. Um, it has a, a single stem, two encoder blocks, and two decoder blocks. A residual block it basically incorporates skip connections to enable you to um, develop deeper networks for better generalization. We take this residual unit, uh, which is also uh, helps you in reducing your computation costs and improves interchannel dependencies. So we take that unit and uh, attach a Fourier neural operator alongside a convolution operation. So now your uh, residual unit basically consists of a batch normalization and a ReLU activation function. Uh, you also have a Fourier layer, and you also have a convolution operation. Now, within the Fourier layer, what we're trying to do is basically um, capture the spectral information of your feature maps. So your, your inputs are transferred into the Fourier domain. You do a matrix multiplication, so you have your weights in the Fourier domain. You apply the inverse uh, Fourier transform, you have, uh, and then you apply a nonlinearity on top of it. Now, the original authors claim that by composing linear integral transformations 
and a nonlinearity on top of it and stacking these multiple operations, you can um, generalize an approximation. You can give a good continuous solution and we will see that. Apart from that, this architecture also simultaneously incorporates a few other blocks like the squeeze and excite blocks, attention layers, uh, and even the address spatial pyramid pooling bridge. Now what do they do? So the attention block is capable of increasing your f effectiveness of your feature maps. So it, it determines which parts of the network requires more attention by combining the uh, feature maps from the encoder and decoder. We then have the SPP bridge layer or the address spatial pyramid pooling layer, which basically again and helps you to enlarge uh, the field of view of your filters uh, uh, by doing many parallel address conv convolutions. Now this also helps you to capture multi-scale information more precisely and that can be useful for heterogeneous PDE tasks. And lastly we have the squeeze and excite layers which aim to improve the sensitivity of relevant features and suppress unnecessary features. We take in the features from the uh, encoder and weigh it with the squeeze and excite layers and they help you to improve your generalization when you have different data sets. We first apply this architecture to a problem in reservoir simulations. You're looking uh, at a problem where we are looking at uh, incompressible two-phase flow. We simulate water injection into a reservoir saturated with oil. And using these simulations, we train our network. And we are predicting water saturation uh, and pressure profiles using previously unseen permeability and porosity maps. So this is a fractional flow model with an elliptic pressure equation and a coupled saturation equation. It represents, it's, it's, it's a simplified physics, but it is representative of the problem. So we simulated uh, 2D extracts from the 10th SPE model. Uh, it, this model is about 1,200 feet by 2,200 feet by 150, 170 feet in depth. Uh, the top layers are, have relatively smoother permeabilities that you see here. And on the bottom layers have narrow high flow uh, channels embedded in them. The uh, orders, uh, the permeability magnitudes differ by at least six orders. Um, and um, we, me we measure the variogram and generate independent realizations. So you have about 6,500 models for training and 300 models for testing. So I'm showing you the simultaneous prediction of both pressure and saturation profiles using a single network with our architecture. In, uh, given unseen permeability and porosity maps, you're looking at the prediction uh, on the top is the true predict, uh, evolution of the true pressure, and on the bottom you're looking at the evolution of the predicted pressure. And we predict every 30 days for about 600 days, and on the right you're seeing the error maps. You will see that the average error for L2 norm is at least three orders of magnitude less, and the, for the L1 norm, it's at least two orders of magnitude less. I then have the true saturation profiles. Again, uh, as the uh, profile evolves, you will see there's a good match between predicted saturation and true saturation. Now you will see, also notice that most of the error for these saturation profiles comes at the uh, boundaries or the edges of the profile. Now that, is, uh, that can potentially be rectified by imposing physical boundary con constraints. And uh, this is work in progress, so we are yet to do that. And these are some evaluation metrics. We compare three kinds of architectures. One, a resu net, which was previously uh, proposed again by Stanford. Um, then the uh, Fourier, original Fourier neural operator uh, proposed by Zongyi Li with fully connected linear layers. And you have the last one is our FRES net plus plus model. Now, although the, the number of trainable parameters increases, and that is because of inclusion of Fourier layers, and that gives you increase in training speeds as well, but we achieve the lowest accuracy. Now for um, practical purposes, the, the, all these errors might seem comparable. But if you are visualizing the predictions, I'll show you the differences. So this is the uh, prediction at the end of 300 days from a simple rest unit model. You can clearly see in the predicted saturation profile, there is some non-smoothness uh, in the predictions, which is more obvious in the difference maps. Then if we, this is the prediction from the Fourier neural operator, the error decreases, but you still see larger errors at the boundaries of the profile and within the saturation profile. And then within the, with the FRES net plus plus architecture, you're greatly reducing this error further. This shows that FRES net plus plus is able to capture the heterogeneity within the saturation profiles, 
uh, provide you with a continuous solution uh, and then also better generalize at the boundaries compared to the other two architectures. And if you're looking at the computational efficiency, um, if you are predicting all the multiple time steps at once, the training data generation took us about, about 14 hours on an Intel i-core, i7, uh, four-core CPU, it was, which is your personal laptop. And then it took, uh, the training time itself took us about um, 2.5 hours on four V100 GPUs. And your predictions is happening at least uh, if by, you're predicting all the 20 time steps simultaneously in five microseconds. So that gives us a speed up of at least uh, by a factor of 10 to the power six, which is significant. Even if you parallelize these simulations on a HP cluster, you will at least get a speed up of 10 to the power three to 10 to the power four. We next apply the same network uh, for CO2 storage simulations. Now this data set, CCSNet data set was created by Stanford. Uh, they predict CO2 injection outputs in a 2D radial saline reservoirs using pre-trained 3D CNN networks. So we will compare our network with their network and see how the results look like. So the training data set here contains about uh, 20,000 input and output images. Um, it's a very rich, diverse data set. Uh, the inputs to this model are uh, your pressures, temperatures, formation thickness, relative permeability, capillary pressure, injection rate, permeability maps, and the perforation interval. So you have about seven scalar, uh, six, seven scalar inputs and one permeability map. Given that your outputs are gas saturation, pressure buildups, molar fractions, and densities in temporal 3D volumes, and you're doing these predictions for about 30 years. So I'm first showing you the results uh, from the uh, saturation and pressure predictions. Here we train a 3D FRSNet++ model as opposed to the 2D network that I previously showed you. Um, the 3D network uh, has basically 3D convolutional layers and 3D Fourier uh, layers. And they help you to better learn uh, long-range interdependencies across various time steps. So given unseen permeability map, a constant temperature, and six other scalar inputs, you're looking at the evolution of true saturation and predicted saturation profiles, and on the bottom, true pressure and predicted pressure profiles. If you're looking at the error maps, the error maps are, are significantly low, at least by, again, three orders of magnitude. I then have uh, the predictions of the molar fractions, the liquid uh, and the gas state fractions. Here, the inputs to the model are not just permeability and six scalar input parameters, but also the previously predicted saturation and pressure profiles. Once again, you're looking, uh, when you're looking at the, these images, you can see a visually a very close match between uh, the predicted profiles and the true ones, and the error is low. And lastly, this is the prediction for liquid and gas phase densities predictions. This time, uh, the, your inputs are unseen permeability maps, seven unseen scalar parameters, previously predicted saturation, pressure, mol and molar fraction estimates. Again, you can see a good match between the predictions and the true uh, solutions. The error is low. We always see some error at the boundaries, but that is in the acceptable range. If I'm comparing the, uh, again, different uh, solutions from different architectures, I have first on the top 2D FRSNet++. On the right, the 3D conventional FNO operator um, uh, proposed in the original paper. On the bottom, uh, you have 3D FRSNet++, and then on the right, you have the CCSNet. If you look at the 2D uh, FRSNet++ prediction, you will see that uh, it doesn't uh, accurately predict the smooth evolution over multiple time steps compared to the 3D. With the 3D FNO, it has problems in recovering uh, the sharper boundaries as the, uh, as, the satur as the gas phase density profile evolves. And with the CCS net, uh, although it gets the structures right, there is a non-uniform uh, amplitude errors at every time step. And this is more prevalent in the background uh, differences that you're seeing. And that shows you the power of 3D FRS net plus plus. So here again are some metrics. Uh, we've taken 250 unseen test cases um, and we predicted using eight V100 GPUs. You're looking at uh, the differences between the 2D FRSNet++, 3D FNO, 3D FRSNet++, and CSCSNet. With the FRSNet++, although the number of your training parameters increase and that your training times increase, you get a significantly uh, lower error, the best error possible, with a speed up of, again, 10 to the power six. 
So the three tuning parameters for all these architectures are one, the number of layers, um, two, the number of feature maps you would have in each layer, and the number of Fourier modes that you would in include in the Fourier layers. The number of uh, the Fourier layers, I should tell you, add significant compute and memory within this entire calculation. So if you are looking at uh, the 2D FresNet++, you will see that there are significantly more trainable parameters than the others. This is because to achieve a good accuracy, we had to include more feature maps and more Fourier modes than the 3D architecture. Similarly, with the 3D FNO, even in spite of increasing the number of feature maps or Fourier modes, there was not much change in the accuracy. But with the 3D FresNet++, we were able to decrease the number of original Fourier modes by about one third and get better accuracy because now we are doing your convolutions uh, both in the spatial and frequency domain um, in the, in the Fourier with the Fourier transforms in 3D. So that some of the key contributions from this work is we introduced FNOs uh, if in a deep residual learning framework for flow simulations in 2D heterogeneous media. You're seeing a speed up by at least a million. Um, and then a, it's capable of better performance by increasing effective generalization over different data sets. We demonstrated uh, the generality of FRESNet++ on uh, two use cases from Earth system predictions, one for reservoir simulations uh, and uh, the other one for CO2 storage simulations. Both represent complex PD simulations from, uh, um, from porous media. And we, you're capable of achieving uh, accurate results on high dimensional inputs, including scalar control parameters. Now this network can also be extended in a, to partially observable settings where you are using it in, Fourier, in a forecast mode. At that point of time, you would be using all the previous data to include within your training, and that in fact improves your accuracy further. And lastly, the 3D network uh, is better compared to the 2D network because it better captures the long range interdependencies. And with that, there are also a lot of future challenges and opportunities. What I've shown you here is a 2D simulations. Where are we going? Um, first, it, these deep learning networks, they require prior simulation investment in terms of training data generation. So it's, it's better to use, develop these surrogate models when you are running thousands of simulations under subsurface uncertainty. That is, you're doing large scale studies over multiple years and not short term projects. Then we are yet to discover the complexity of physics that the deep learning networks can emulate. Uh, we, need, we need, if it's coupled with geomechanics and other related physics, how would these networks perform? There is uh, a challenge of de-risking the scalability to 3D complex real life problems and that requires both uh, distributed HPC uh, um, uh, and not just for 3D training, but also for generating the data itself. Um, and then we also have to explore uh, its applicability limits in terms of generalization. That means for a given problem, how much of training data is needed, how diverse should this data shed sh should be, for real case studies is unknown. And uh, finally, a demonstration of application of uh, these surrogate models in real case studies where you're doing uncertainty quantification, scenario testing, model-based optimization, or related inverse problems. So this is something uh, that we would be focusing for the future. With that, thank you for being such a great audience. I can take any questions. That's right. Yeah, we, yeah we, we do see that, but if you incorporate more Fourier modes, that error tends to decrease. Um, so that's one remedy for that, but, but you're right, yeah.
Hi, thank you. Very nice talk. Um, I have a question kind of about uh, more in the future. Do you see that going kind of the route of the natural language models where you have one giant GPT-3 model, for example, that can do everything? Would think maybe this is going to go somewhere like that where we have just John, one giant model, for example, um, that would work on a whole basin scale or you have to train maybe more on a smaller scale? That's a good question. We've been actually trying to use a similar architectures for other large scale problems, but there is a huge challenge of even fitting one entire model into the GPU for training. So that limits the applicability of such networks for these problems. Uh, hopefully, in the future, if we can get better compression on how we reduce these 3D models in a compressed domain and then use it to input it, it into deep learning architectures, if we can uh, make significant enhancements in that direction, then I'm sure we will be able to do that. Well, thank you very much.